everyone, and welcome to today's Seed World Strategy webinar. Uh, my name is Alex Martin, and I serve as an associate editor for Seed World, and today I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is tackling soybean cyst nematode in a new way. We, we will be live tweeting during today's webinar, so if you'd like to join our conversation, please use the hashtag strategy webinar. And during the presentation, you'll likely have some questions for our speaker. At, uh, please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we'll address them during our Q&A session we'll hold after both speakers finish their presentations. Also, during the presentation, we'll have a few poll questions for you. They'll pop up in your chat box as well for you to answer. We'd also like to let you know today that uh, our webinar is being recorded and will be made available at seedworld.com following the proceedings. Uh, presenting the webinar today is Dr. George Bird, a professor at Michigan State University, and Dr. Rick Masonbrink, an associate scientist at, in the genome informatics facility at Iowa State University. In today's webinar, you'll learn the current landscape of soybean cyst nematode management, including a few seed treatment options out there that might help, help you minimize the pest, as well as why the sequencing of the soybean cyst gene, nematode genome matters and how that might affect management in the future. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. George Bird. George is a professor at Michigan State University where he does research, teaches, and conducts agricultural outreach programs. He received his Bachelor's of Science and his Master's of Science from Rutgers University and his PhD from Cornell University. Before coming to MSU in 1973, he was a research scientist with Agriculture Canada and an associate professor at the University of Georgia. He is a former president of the Society of Nematologists, and during the past five years, George has been a part of a team that has developed the new Soybean Cyst Nematode Coalition. He is looking forward to interacting with you on uh, Soybean Cyst Nematode today. Well, George, go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon. For the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking to you about the soybean cyst nematode, its risk to soybean production, some management aspects, and the coalition, the soybean cyst nematode coalition. So if we look at the soybean cyst nematode, it has been known to be present in the United States since 1954. However, by 1959, it had already been detected in southern Illinois. If we go fast forward to today, uh, you can see that as recently as 2016, there was a new find in upstate New York, and there are new counties in which the soybean cyst nematode is being detected readily in uh, North Dakota. Soybean cyst nematode is considered as the number one limiting factor in soybean production in the United States. And in this particular slide right here, all of the counties in red, uh, soybean cyst nematode has been confirmed. I would now like to talk to you for just a moment or two about soybean cyst nematode biology. In the upper left-hand corner, the red sphere there is the dead female cyst body wall. We've stained it red so you can see it a little bit uh, uh, better. And we've also crushed it, and you can see over at the right-hand side, maybe 150 or so eggs pouring out of this cyst. And these eggs can remain viable in the soil, in the cyst, for 8, 10, or 12 years in the absence of a host. Just below that, where we have a photograph of the egg, you can see coiled in this egg is the second stage juvenile, which is the infective stage. And going pointing over towards about 9 o'clock, you can see the nematode stylet. All nematodes have, plant parasitic nematodes, have a stylet that they use for their feeding. And this is done very much like what a mosquito does when it feeds uh, on your arm. And you have a better illustration of this stylet in the slide over here on the right. One of the most interesting things in science today is communications among organisms. 
We're talking here basically mainly about chemical ecology. And over in the slide on the left of this particular uh, uh, illustration, you can see a nematode down at about uh, six o'clock, and it has inserted its stylet into this plant cell, but has instructed the plant cell to make a feeding tube. And in this particular case, because of this communications, the nematode does its feeding through this tube that is somewhat like a straw. Another good example of chemical communications is over on the right. And at about three o'clock, you can see this female, a young swollen female, and she knows that she's going to become pregnant and not be able to move again. So she communicates with the plant and requests the plant to build her nurse cells so she will have the matter and energy necessary to feed her young. And so you can see here these very, very large, very cytoplasmic and multinucleate nurse cells that are going to be fed on by the nematode. And of course, the matter and energy now going into the nematode, we had hoped would have gone into developing uh, the beans. Soybean cyst nematode, you have to look for symptoms beneath the ground. You have to dig or pull plants. And when you look at a soybean root system, if it is weak, and if it has poor nodulation, that might be an initial symptom of the soybean cyst nematode. If you look at the top of this photograph, the uh, needle coming in from about 1 o'clock is pointing towards the white females that contain 150 or 200 eggs or so. And the needle that's coming in from about 2 o'clock is pointing at a nitrogen-fixing nodule. But you can see with this root system that there's very little it's poor nodulation. It's very, very important when pulling plants to scout for soybean cyst nematode that you know the difference between nodules and soybean cyst nematode females. You can see the soybean cyst nematode females with the naked eye, but they are very small. If we now take a look at a soybean, soybean field from an aerial view, you will see uneven growth, patterns of stunted plant, and yellow foliage, but you do not always have this yellow foliage. You do not always have these types of very visible symptoms. Going back to the root system, one looks for the white SCN females on the roots. Uh, it's also associated with a low number of bean pods and a low number of beans per uh, pod. And yield losses can be anywhere from uh, 5 to 90 percent yield losses. So it is a very, very serious problem. Uh, moving on from this example here. I need to go back. Soybean cyst nematode became such a problem back in the late 1980s that in the early 1990s, a soybean cyst nematode coalition was formed. The motto of this coalition was take the test, beat the pest. And what this means is that the growers were encouraged to scout for the soybean cyst nematode as they received various educational programs through this initial soybean cyst uh, nematode coalition. Well, what was the results of this coalition? Well, the coalition was successful. The coalition was successful because the growers began to use resistant varieties for control of soybean cyst nematode based on the education scouting programs and also the use of, uh, of crop rotation on their farms. And this worked and it worked very successfully uh, for maybe 20 or, or 25 years. But now let's take a look at this uh, graph here. Uh, over on the uh, Y axis, you see the number of varieties that are available for the farmers to purchase and time on the x-axis. And where you have these gray bars, these are the number of varieties uh, that have been developed from a one source of resistance to the soybean cyst nematode known as PI88788, where you have the red portion of these uh, uh, bars. These are other varieties that would have been come from other uh, sources of resistance, but you can see that there are very few of these available. And today there are even relatively few SCN susceptible varieties available. So for more than 20 years, U.S. soybean growers uh, 
planted about 95% of their resistant varieties uh, from a single source of resistance. This now has resulted in a fairly uh, major problem. Things changed and the nematode populations at the field level became aggressive. What that means is they could reproduce on the resistant varieties and also cause yield losses on the resistant varieties. So what I like to say is that too much of a good thing resulted in resistance to uh, resistance. Now let's take a look at the north central uh, soybean production region uh, and see how prevalent this is or how serious a problem it is. And you can see that a significant number of states are reporting a large percentage of aggressive SCN populations that will reduce yields and reproduce on resistant varieties derived from PI88788. But one thing I want you to notice in this map is that there's no number there for Iowa. And the reason for that is we probably know more about this particular problem in Iowa than in any other state. So if we go to some of Greg Tilka's uh, data, and Greg in the United States is the only nematologist that works 100% on soybean cis nematode, uh, you can see here on the y-axis, uh, this is the SCN reproduction, or a percent reproduction uh, on uh, 88788 resistant varieties. And you can see back in 2000, it was about 10% uh, for the most part. But if we look at today, you can see that many of these uh, uh, varieties developed from PI 88788, the nematode populations now increase well above, okay, uh, 10%. So with a resistant variety, uh, the goal is to keep the reproduction uh, less than 10%. Moving on, okay, what does this mean from a yield standpoint or an economic standpoint? And when the nematode begins to be aggressive, and reproduce on varieties derived from 88788, yields will be reduced. And it is estimated that this reduction can be an average of about 14 bushels per acre. And I don't know about uh, your growers, but uh, here in Michigan, uh, the vast majority of their uh, uh, profit would be in these 14 bushels uh, per acre. So because of this, in 2016, uh, there was a survey conducted of 1,300 uh, North Central soybean growers. And the survey identified that many of these growers were not farming during the first SCN coalition, that only a very limited number of them were scouting for soybean cis nematode, even though they were using a single source of resistance. And so through this survey, we were able to detect that the aggressiveness of SCN populations was very definitely increasing and very definitely a problem. So in 2019, from the coalition, uh, what are the recommendations for management of sleeping system attitude? Number one is to scout. Number two, basically, is know your SCN population density or number. And unfortunately, however, there are different types of SCN, and these are populations that are field specific. So you also have to know your SCN type. It's good to practice crop rotation. It's good to plant varieties that are appropriate for managing your specific SCN uh, type. It's good to rotate uh, varieties because all varieties are, are not equal, even though they have the genes for uh, SCN resistance. And lastly, consider using a nematode uh, seed treatment. So through the coalition, those are uh, the major recommendations at the moment. But now we need to get more specific. And this is sometimes a very difficult thing to uh, teach at the, at the grower level. So the first thing from the scouting, uh, using like a handful of soil or 100 cubic centimeters of soil, uh, can a population be detected? Is it low, medium, or high? And the thresholds for action vary among different labs. When you come down to what population type is it, if it is type 1, 
a type 1 population reproduces and causes yield losses on the king. Varieties that are derived from the king as a source of resistance. A type 2 population is a population that reproduces on varieties derived from PI 88788. And the third type that I'm going to introduce to you today would be a type 1.2. And unfortunately, a type 1.2 is one that will reproduce and re result in yield reductions on varieties on derived from either Peking or 88788. And of course, these are the, uh, the 88788 and Peking are the two major source of resistance for varieties that are available in 2019. So how does all of this relate to the action at the grower level? Well, if you have a, um, uh, a, a susceptible variety, you should not plant SCN uh, if the population, you should not plant that variety if the SCN population is above the damage threshold. If you have a PI888 derived variety, it's okay to plant for control of types 0. And I call type 0 a, a wimpy type and type 1. Uh, if you have a variety that's derived from the king, which is also known as PI 548-402. Now, this is okay for control, again, of SCN, if it's the WIPI type, type 0, and also type 2. No 2019 varieties, unfortunately, are readily available for control of an SCN population that's categorized as a type 1.2. The next thing I want to go to basically is a little information on seed treatments. And this particular slide is one we could probably spend as much as 40 minutes on, but seed treatments are important today. So we need to discuss this. There are at least eight different uh, nematocyte or nematode SCN control seed treatments that are available uh, for use uh, today. And these are listed over on the left hand side of this slide. Uh, some of these are specific for soybean cis nematode, and some are uh, efficacy on uh, a number of different crops. Uh, when you go to the nematodes targeted, some of these are specific for just soybean cis nematode, and some of them uh, uh, can control uh, all types of plant parasitic nematodes. When one looks at the active ingredients, uh, like uh, with Evicta, which is abermictin, uh, abermictin is a chemical nematicide. When one goes to inhibit, the active ingredients is a harpin protein, and a harpin protein is basically a plant health regulator. Uh, looking at uh, Votiva here, uh, the active ingredients is a living organism, a bacterium, uh, Bacillus firmus. Uh, Chlorina is another uh, uh, bacterium, uh, uh, Pasturia, and so on. So. There are a number of different active ingredients, and the modes of action uh, are all a little bit uh, different. So what the coalition is recommending today uh, is that the growers work closely with their seedsmen, and if they're going to use a seed treatment, uh, have some research data associated uh, with that, and maybe even some of their own on-farm uh, research. I normally recommend to farmers that while I can give them general information about soybean cyst nematode management, they have to be the researcher that knows more about their particular farm sites and fields uh, than anybody else. So in conclusion, for my part of this webinar, uh, there is much, much more to learn about soybean cyst nematode than I was able to cover in the last 13 or 15 minutes. And I would strongly recommend that you go to the new SCN Coalition website. And that website is at www.thescncoalition.com. And thank you for listening, even though we couldn't bring it up uh, readily uh, through the computer system and had to use a cell phone. Well, thank you so much, George, for, for that presentation. It was wonderful, even with the technical difficulties. Um, so please don't forget, if you have a question for George, go ahead and type it in the chat box and we'll address it during our Q&A portion of the webinar. Our final speaker of the day is Dr. Rick Masonbrink. Rick is a first generation scientist whose interest stems from a love of nature, life and evolution. 
And as a graduate student at the University of Missouri, R Rick worked on engineered chromosomes with Dr. James Birchler. It wasn't until his second postdoctoral fellowship that he began working on soybean cyst nematode. That, that project entailed characterizing the genome of soybean cyst nematode. Now he works as an associate scientist in the genome informatics facility at Iowa State University, where he works on a multitude of projects, including a continuation of his previous research. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Rick, and uh, feel free to take it away. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the soybean cyst nematode genome today. Um, just to start out, we kind of have to have an understanding of, of what an SCN field population is. So George gave us a nice introduction, so I don't really have to do a lot of describing what SCN is and its resistance. But one of the things that is important is to know that your field populations, each of these individuals in your field population are not the same. So each one of these little dots here in this slide is representing a different individual, we'll say. And within this population, you have at least giant diversity. The problem with that is, is that you have all of these diversity, you have this, this diversity in the population, and you have these resistant varieties that continually get planted in the field, which is something that George addressed. And then eventually these, these individuals that are susceptible to this resistance and can't reproduce, they're eliminated from the population. And what you're left with, say, for example, what you're left with, say, that your resistant varieties, the only ones that survive are the, the green ones. So then you lose all of these other diverse individuals that are black, red, and yellow. Now, when we went to sequence the soybean cyst nematode genome, we had some of these issues because, you know, soybean cyst nematode is very small. So it, getting enough DNA to sequence this and make a genome was, was very difficult. So we had to use 200,000 individuals, so the SCN eggs. And the problem is, is that even though we have some inbred varieties of SCN, they're not really very inbred because they can't handle it. Uh, not like a plant where you can inbreed for generation upon generation. SCN, it eventually dies out in the population or tank. So we lose them. So our inbred varieties still are quite diverse. And so that's what is represented here in these, these different colored dots. We have these, all these diverse individuals. And then when we assemble a genome, we have these reads, these long reads from all of these different uh, individuals and they get smished together in your genome. And so your genome is kind of a chimera unlike what you would find in any other typical uh, mammal genome or plant genome. We just can't sequence a single individual yet. The technology just isn't there. So what we had to do is we had to use 200,000 eggs and get as much coverage as we possibly could. So we have these long reads that can span um, repeats in the genome. So the problem would be, um, the soybean cyst nematode has almost a third of its genome is these repeats. And we try to circumvent the, the problem of having repeats in the genome by using long reads. And if your reads are not long enough to cover the length of the repeat, then we don't know for sure what's in that region. And so those regions get collapsed and get missing from the genome or they don't get assembled. And so to get around all of these problems, we had to use some really creative methods to get um, the the assembly done. And so we used, uh, we took these long reads from PacBio, of these uh, DNA sequencing long reads from PacBio, and we mapped um, the transcripts. We already had a, a transcript dome from uh, soybean cyst nematode, and we mapped these transcripts to these PacBio reads, and then uh, took those reads and assembled them with CAP3, and then used Falcon and Bandage to manipulate the assembly and the assembly graph to try and get it down as to as few scaffolds as we could possibly get without manipulating the genome size or losing too many genes. And so what we ended up getting was a genome that had 738 scaffolds, which when you compare that to nematodes from related clades like the cyst nematode, which many of you may be familiar with, the Globidura species, and then the root knot species, which um, are not closely related to SCN, but are also plant parasitic nematodes. And this happens to be one of the, the best assemblies at the time. 
But actually, we, we know that soybean cyst nematode has nine chromosomes. And so what we've, the, the ideal genome assembly is to get every chromosome as one single piece of DNA. And so what we did was we used, uh, we ended up using dovetail and some high C reads, which allow you to see the 3D structure of the DNA to be able to move all these contigs around and split them and break them and fuse them until we got what looks like nine pseudomolecules. And this figure right here, I'm not actually sure where this came from. It's some old literature, but someone did some cytology at SCN at one point. And so now we do have a nine molecule or nine pseudomolecule assembly that I'm still, that's I'm currently working on trying to get the genes predicted and we'll try to get that out within the next year. But the real point of this webinar is how can we how can we use the genome for soybean improvement? How can we uh, utilize this information? So some of the, the steps to do this would be we have one inbred population that we used for a genome. So we have this one population, but every population is different and you can have different populations develop resistance in different ways. So the problem is, is we need we need more sequencing. We need more sequencing for bunches of different populations so we can start to identify what genomic features or genes are causing virulence for the soybean cyst nematode to overcome resistance and reproduce. And then because we have multi, if we can get multiple populations, then we can see how these populations are, are changing, whether it's the same mechanism or if it's a different mechanism. And then uh, George talked about how these uh, the two main sources of soybean cyst nematode resistance in soybean. Um, some of these, not all, but many of the genes are uh, subject to copy number variation or increases in gene copy number that affect the resistance. So you increase the gene copy number, you're more likely to get resistance. Um, so when you look at a host in a parasite, you have kind of a, an arms race. So when you get a resistance gene, you have a virulence gene that allows the soybean cyst nematode to reproduce. And then after it reproduces so much, you have the host that develops another resistance gene. And it just works in that cycle so on until you have these multiple copies of stacked genes. And so that's one of the things that's likely affecting soybean resistance. And it's likely that it's also affecting soybean cyst nematode virulence. So um, once we can figure out how many, which genes are affected by uh, copy number variation, if they've increased a number, um, we can figure out perhaps what is uh, part of the arms race in SCN versus soybean. And then another possible approach is to try and figure out, so what causes different worms to hatch? So we don't know exactly, we know we can use, stimulate with zinc, but we don't know what causes them to hatch. Not all nematodes will hatch and they can stay at each, each season, not all nematodes will hatch and they can stay in the field for up to 10 years without hatching. And so figuring out what causes different worms to hatch would be one of those uh, things that we can use the genome for. Uh, there are, so looking into perhaps as uh, zinc binding proteins would be one approach to defining that. And we have all of these different genes. We have them functionally annotated in the genome and we can try and figure out um, which genes may be responsible for causing SCN to hatch. But then there's also the fact that once they do hatch, how do they find the host? Um, so we know that nematodes, especially plant parasitic nematodes have had these expansions, these gene expansions of serpentine receptors, serpentine receptors, which are these chemosensory receptors and sensing chemicals, and that's what causes them to uh, move to whatever chemical it is that draws them. And so figuring those genes out and, and understanding what they bind and how they work would be one approach to use the genome to find ways to improve soybean yield. Uh, the last approach is something that we've been working on for quite a while, more than just me here, um, is to look at effectors. So in this figure at the top, you can see uh, an oblong female about two o'clock there, and um, she's infecting the soybean root. And you can see the uh, enlarged soybean root, which is this in situ, the feeding site that George already talked about. And we know that the soybean cyst nematode has a gland that secretes these different proteins and molecules into the cell, which you can see in the bottom figure. 
And these molecules almost always have a, a signal peptide, which uh, is signal for secretion. They lack a transmembrane domain, so they're not getting integrated into the membrane and they are differentially expressed in the gland of the soybean cyst nematode. So that's kind of the qualifications to make a gene or a protein an effector. And we know a whole lot of these already. We know 80 of them. The genome increased that 80 number to 121. But a lot of these have many different functions. I didn't list them all here, but there's cellulases, which allow the nematode to migrate through the roots. There's uh, pectoliases, which do the same. Uh, there's chromatin modifiers to manipulate the host's genome to ma manipulate expression. You can, uh, the soybean cyst nematode affects carbohydrate metabolism because it wants to take those carbohydrates back into itself. And then there's immune suppression, which allows the, uh, the soybean cyst nematode to avoid uh, cell death by the host cell. So looking in, and identifying these will be a big target in the future. And once we find these genes, we should be able to figure out what's causing virulence. And the great thing about doing the genome is that we created all these awesome resources that can tell you many things about the genome. We have all these genes. We know that these genes that are effectors that are being duplicated by transposons, there's uh, regions of the genome that are conserved with other nematode, closely related nematode species. So we can um, try to understand what's changing in this genome. And this, this will all be continually be improved. We can use, uh, there's different tools on this website. This is already open. We're working on this paper right now. Um, so you can use BLAST uh, to find your specific gene. You can go to JBrowse and look at over 43 different tracks of different uh, genomic information. Uh, there's a lot of information that can be had here, and you can even email us to find uh, if there's something you can't find. Um, but with the new pseudomolecule assembly, which will be up here soon, uh, we should be able to do even more things. And so that's, that's all I have to say. I've been supported by a lot of people. Uh, the genome had a lot of people work on it besides just me. It wasn't a singular effort. and. I had my primary funding was the, from the North Central Soybean Research Program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Well, um, now I would love to do a short Q&A session. Um, so if you have a question for Rick or for George, please type that into the chat box now and we'll answer it as we go. Um, so now, George, I think I think this first question is actually for you that I got. Um, and someone wants to know how widespread is type 1.2 um, populations? Well, I can, I can only speak uh, for my knowledge here in Michigan, uh, but uh, I've seen it maybe in a dozen fields or so. Okay. So the way we want to solve this from a resistance standpoint is we need to begin to get commercially viable uh, varieties that come from other sources of resistance other than just 88788 or Peking. So we have it in uh, commercial fields in Michigan, but it is far from dominant. It'd be a minor number. But uh, if Peking varieties or 8878 varieties are not working for you, uh, make sure you get a type test because it could be that it's a type 1.2. Okay, thank you so much, George. Um, Rick, I think my next question is for you. So you gave us a lot of great information about the sequencing and the history behind the sequencing of the, the soybean cyst, uh, genome. Uh, now, what in the future, how might that affect breeders in the future when breeding for more resistant soybean lines? Well, I was saying something about how we can use the genome to try and figure out what genes are acting to do the different uh, effector functions in soybean, in soybean. And so when we figure out what's being manipulated in soybean, we can figure out how to shut it off. And so we can engineer, we can't really engineer soybean cyst nematode yet, but we can engineer soybean to make these things that, that would help either identify when soybean cyst nematode is attacking or um, 
how to constantly just shut it off, prevent it from hatching, uh, be, prevent it from being attracted, things like that. It's okay. still in the future, but it's it's coming. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, now, I'm just going to open this question up to both of you. I'm not sure who would like to answer it, but um, we just got another question that says, to what extent can seed treatments treat the new resistant cis nematodes? Um, George, this might be a little bit more up your alley, but if you have something you'd like to say as, uh, uh, as well, Rick, please don't hesitate to jump in. Okay, I, I'll take a stab at it uh, first. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all of those seed treatments, with maybe the exception of inhibit, okay, are only recommended for use on uh, resistant varieties, okay? Uh, so basically what it is doing is giving you an additional boost, okay? Uh, none of them uh, on soybean cyst nematode. And soybean cyst nematode is a tough critter. It's more much more difficult to control than a lot of the other plant parasitic nematodes. So that's why it's being used in a combination of resistance, okay, uh, plus the uh, uh, seed uh, treatment. So that's a start, okay, uh, on the answer to that. But what you need to do if you're doing some research related to this, uh, you need to detect or determine whether or not the seed treatment is reducing the nematode population or whether it is result resulting in not a reduction in yield. But the ultimate control, okay, would be where the combination of the resistant variety plus the seed treatment not only results in very low final population densities of the nematode, but also very high uh, bean yields. And that's tough. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, George. Rick, did you have anything you wanted to say to you? So I'm not an expert in this particular for this question, but uh, it shocks me that seed treatments actually work. Um, after you, I mean, I, I'm guessing that the best way that they do work is that it prevents soybean cyst nematode infection to a certain stage. And once the soybean gets to that stage, maybe soybean cyst nematode infection isn't that big of a deal. So they may have play some function, but I agree with George, you have to have it in com combination with the resistant variety because later in the life after the, the seeds are coated, once that coating is gone or the, the roots have expanded beyond what the chemical on the, on the seed can, can treat, then soybean is still going to, a soybean cyst nematode is still going to attack the roots. Yes, I agree with that. In other words, uh, sooner you can get or prevent your nematode control, or, or you, sooner you can get nematode control, the better off you're going to be because the plant, the uh, nematode can do much more damage on very young plants and very young root systems than on older ones. So if you want to monitor your success with this, uh, you need to take your soil samples and your root samples very, very early. And uh, if you wait to 30, 60 or 90 days after planting, uh, you may not be able to show that you've reduced the population. But if you take these samples early, uh, you may be able to demonstrate that. Okay, thank you so much, both of you. That they, Those were just fantastic answers. Um, our next question, I'm not sure who to pose this to either, but um, is there any constant uh, concerted effort in finding novel sources of resistance for soybean cyst nematode? I'll let Rick start and then I'll uh, maybe go on afterwards. Okay, I would have thought George would have been better for this one. But yes, there there are. Um, I'm working on the soybean cyst nematode side, so I don't really see the soybean as much, but I do know that there are people working on that, and I couldn't tell you if it's concerted. That's about all I can say. George? Well, I'm not sure that my answer will be directed exactly at, like that, but there are people searching for novel sources uh, of resistance. Uh, there are a lot of the genetic researchers that basically are looking at this from stacking, okay, genes into uh, uh, future varieties, if we can call um, uh, that uh, novel. 
But uh, I think one thing that we missed talking about today is that, you know, in the USDA uh, soybean plant bank, there are about 109 known different sources of resistance. And uh, only seven of these have ever been commercialized. Uh, so it may be difficult to get the agronomic properties out of these, uh, but there are many other uh, known uh, uh, sources of resistance. And then if you want to go to something that uh, I, I consider novel, okay, is I'm trying to develop a, a, a uh, trap crop using a source of resistance uh, for the nematode that uh, has not is not in commercial lines at the moment. So what we might be able to do if we succeed with this, we'll be planting it like after wheat. OK, it'll trap the nematodes and kill them or the rest would be killed in winter. And then the next year you could go on with your corn. So I would be using sort of a resistant source as a trap crop and cover crop type of combination. I don't know if you consider that novel or not, but uh, we're doing that research. Awesome. Thank you so much, both of you. OK, here's our next question. Um, given its dormant lifespan without a host, is there any particular crop rotation or soil management that might inhibit it? Are there, you know, maybe cover crops that might unintentionally sustain it? Rick, you want me to take it? You go first. <laughs> okay. Well, now, well, fortunately, okay, uh, soybean cyst nematode, uh, there are many plants that are non-hosts for it. So that it will not be reducing on that. Uh, the graminaceae, uh, the grain crops, uh, uh, corn, uh, wheat, uh, all of these are non-hosts for the soybean uh, uh, nematode. Once you start getting into legumes, uh, which are parts of many blends of cover crops, uh, many of these uh, plants are, uh, are are hosts or relatively poor hosts. So we do have options, okay? Uh, so the greater the diversity uh, you have in a farming system, the lower the risk to get the problem and the lower the risk for increasing, okay, uh, uh, the uh, problem over time. And then while there's very, well, there's a lot of interest in cover crop research at the moment, uh, but we're still working on that. But there will be a role there for cover crops. Uh, to play. And then the last one is the soil health issue. And of course, soil health relates to greater biological diversity. And while we don't have definitive research data on soybean cyst nematode for you uh, at, at the moment, uh, I, I would say the healthier the soil, the uh, greater the chance that you're not going to have a soybean cyst nematode problem. But uh, that probably uh, has not been conclusively proven yet. I can add a little bit to that. <clears throat> um, I know of a few different strategies they use in Europe. So there's something called a, a fodder radish, which can cause soybean cyst nematode to hatch, but they can't parasitize or reproduce on it. So it does reduce the, the populations in the field. But uh, just as George said, you pretty much want to stay away from legumes, which might cause them to hatch, but they can also marginally reproduce on these. So soybean is still the primary host for soybean cyst nematode, but there are different things like different beans and um, there are some clovers that it can reproduce on. So to stay away from those would be. And then uh, also, I've also heard of people steaming, steaming fields, but you have to have large machinery for that. And it's probably expensive. So those two things are the only two that George didn't mention. You know, there are many, many different types, okay, of cyst nematodes. Uh, in my state of Michigan, we have confirmed the identification of 11 different species of, uh, of cyst nematodes. In addition to soybean cyst nematode, we have a close cousin called uh, the sugar beet cyst nematode. And of course, we have a major sugar beet industry in Michigan. The Germans, fortunately, have developed varieties of um, oilseed radish, okay, uh, that are trap crops for the beet system. Now, 
However, to the best of our knowledge, we have never been able to show uh, that these varieties like Colono, Adagio, uh, Image are uh, trap crops for the soybeans of snow too. So once this gets out in the agricultural community, uh, there are some points that are very specific and they sometimes result in confusion. Hey, excellent. Thank you both. Um, another question, this is kind of stemming from the same conversation, is um, has there any, has there been any success in using alternative host plants like marigolds for control? Rick, do you want to make any comments? Uh, that's just uh, the same. I haven't heard anything about marigold, but there was a recent a uh, presentation from someone in uh, Greg Tilka's lab that was talking about looking for these different cover crops and they did not find a significant change in many different species that they looked at, including cereal crops. They didn't see a, a decline in the populations, but that's, that's about all I know. Yeah, so you've got to, uh, there's several things here. You don't want the population increase, okay? Uh, keeping it level at wherever it is is better than it increasing. But what we're really looking for is, is something that will decrease it. And that has not uh, uh, really been identified yet. But the point uh, I really want to make here is that cis nematodes are tough. Cis nematodes are tougher to control, okay, than many of the other plant parasitic uh, uh, nematodes. So you sometimes have to have multiple tactics to get that population down and, and fortunately we have both resistant varieties and seed treatments and so we want to make sure we use those in a very judicious manner okay excellent thank you so much um our next question came in and it says looks like naturally occurring resistance coming from wild um exception pi lines have some linkage drag, and that might be the reason for difficulty in developing new varieties with resistance. Are we creating any mutant population, for example, by EMS treatment, with the objective of finding genetic resistance? I don't know anything about that. This has got to be you, George. Okay, great. Well, I, I, think, I think that is, is true. Uh, remember, uh, I said earlier that one of my research projects is to discover a trap crop that is going to be used, okay, as a cover crop to reduce the population. We have not done that yet, but I'm going to let you in on the secret, okay, and that is that uh, uh, the main trap crop that we're trying to research is a soybean. Uh, it doesn't look like a soybean. It's very, very small, it's black, it's not brown, uh, it's oblong, but it has the properties for reducing uh, soybean cis nematode. So uh, the variability that we have in you know, the, the wild related species and things uh, may have potential for using in novel ways. I hope what I just said made some sense, I don't know. Um, a year ago now, I had less than a pound of that seed. Now I've got uh, 60 some and we're going to be planting about uh, three and a half acres and to uh, increase seed to see if it works. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, George. Um, and then now it looks like we're going back to diversity in soil. So does um, soybean cis nematode have any natural predators or is there any research into that aspect for clearing out existing populations? Um, as you mentioned, steaming, Rick, um, is there any soil temperature which can inhibit soybean nematode populations active or dormant? So I think that's two questions there, actually. So there are predatory nematodes, but I have not worked in nematodes long enough to tell you what they are and if we can use them. And steaming is something that I have seen and has said that it's it's effective, but you have to use these large large machinery to get it to work, and I believe it's expensive. That's, that's this is information from Greg Tilka that I've asked about. But that's about all I know I can answer for those questions. George, I'll take a stab at it. Okay, 
there are predatory nematodes, nematodes that feed on other nematodes, but we don't, we're not going to be relying on that, okay, uh, in, in, the, in the near future. However, soybean cyst nematode does have a, a large number of other uh, uh, nat natural enemies, okay, uh, in, the, in the soil. Uh, there are bacteria, and of course, in my last slide today of the seed treatments, you can see where two of these are, are actually being marketed in various ways. Uh, there's a bacillus on there, uh, which is a bacterium, and there's a pastoria, which is a bacterium, and those are being used for biological control. And I can also remember that uh, one of my former undergraduate students here, when she went on to uh, graduate school, she actually wrote a book on the fungal uh, pathogens of, uh, uh, of cis nematodes. So there's, there's quite a bit known. Uh, it's George. George, can you hear me? I don't know if anyone can hear me, but uh, so the genetic basis for the two naturally occurring resistance is understood. I don't know enough about this, but there are multiple genes and no, they do not know what these, these resistance, these sources of resistance are binding, what they're interacting with in the soybean cyst nematode. That's, that's something under current research. So sorry about that, everyone. We just had a little bit of a technical dif difficulty with that. So I'm going to see if we can get George to repeat his his answer real quick. George, if you don't mind, too. I'll, I'll abbreviate it. Uh, there are predaceous nematodes that feed on other nematodes. But my experience tells me that I wouldn't rely on those for the uh, future of uh, uh, soybean cyst nematode management. Soybean cyst nematode has many bacterial pathogens and many fungal pathogens, and a significant number of these are either have been developed uh, as biological control agents, and uh, some of these are being used, okay, uh, in the seed treatment uh, formulations. So there is significant uh, uh, potential there. And of course, there are with uh, uh, enhancing soil health ways that you could uh, potentially uh, increase the utility of some of these organisms. Thank you so much, George. Okay, I think we have enough time for just one more question. And I, I'm actually going to ask this question and it's gonna be a little theoretical, but do you both think it might be possible to use gene editing in the future to breed a more resistant soybean or maybe to, to help with a uh, soybean cis nematode? Absolutely. Yes, uh, that's that's something that I believe will be our one of our next coming out things. It's it's the companies have a lot more um, funding behind and probably have a lot more genomes and genetic resources for SCN to help understand what uh, what genes they're manipulating in the soybean. So those so once our current resistance runs out or stop selling, that's that's when they'll start developing more things. Okay, well, in answering that question, I'm going to ignore it and say something that uh, I forgot to say uh, uh, earlier. <laughs> if you go to the SDN Coalition website, uh, coming up in the near future, you're going to see that there are going to be several toad doers. Okay, toad is sort of our code name these days for uh, nematodes. And at the University of Georgia, there's going to be a, a toad tour based on some of the most uh, uh, recent uh, genetic information, and sometime in the future, there's going to be a toad tour at Iowa State University for, feed manage for, for field management aspects of the issue. So I encourage you to be logging on uh, to the SCN Coalition website to find more about these two opportunities if they interest you. Okay, well, thank you both for, for answering that question.
Um, well, so I think that is all the time we have for today. But I'd like to give a big thank you to our speakers, George and Rick, one last time for joining us today. And thank you so much to everyone for participating in our webinar. We really enjoyed your questions and they were just fabulous. I hope you found this information of value. Um, again, a recording of this webinar will be made available later today at seedworld.com. Uh, thanks again and we hope you have a terrific day. This is Alex Martin of Seed World signing off.